Long before the arrival of the newcomers, Nabi gambled in the mountains. He used a special song and was able to win all the black waters flowing down from the eastern slopes. This is Gidoksinon, what sustains us. This is what we call our Blackfoot territory. It encompasses everything from the North Saskatchewan River here in Alberta to the Yellowstone River in Wyoming and from the Rocky Mountains far east to the Great Sand Hills in Saskatchewan. Other tribes belong to different waters, but this is our place. It's been that way for thousands of years. During certain seasons, especially in the summer, our way of life involved being on the move. There were places we went to to hunt buffalo, and others where we got elk. There were special places, abundant berries, and lakes where we could easily harvest waterfowl eggs. Everywhere we moved was for a purpose, and we would camp in the same areas every year. We would mark these locations with rings of stone, mamma bis. With the arrival and the settlements of newcomers in the 1860s, the traditional way of life of the Nitsitapi, the Siksika, Gana, Bikani, and Amskapi Bikani nations changed. After the U.S. Civil War ended in 1865, young men flooded into Montana in search of gold and other ventures. Settlement expanded into the newly created Montana Territory. Meanwhile, Canada joined in Confederation in 1867, and Western Canada, the Northwest Territories as it was then known, was transferred to the Young Dominion. However, the government had no real presence in the West. An American law made it illegal to sell or trade alcohol in Montana's Indian country, but alcohol was widely used as an incentive for trade with indigenous people. When the Hudson's Bay Company and the American Fur Company withdrew from the trade in the late 1860s, free traders stepped in. Beyond the reach of the law, the Canadian prairies were filled with opportunity for gold prospectors, wolfers, and whiskey traders. In December 1869, Alfred B. Hamilton and John J. Healy obtained supplies from Fort Benton, Montana and headed north. They set up a trading post at the meeting of the St. Mary and Belly, now Old Man, Rivers a traditional gathering site for the bands of the Blackfoot Confederacy. The site would become the center of a booming commercial trading post system. Fort Hamilton was a simple structure with six rooms. Healy and Hamilton made huge profits in their first season, but their fort was badly damaged in a fire. Healy and Hamilton decided to build a larger, more permanent fort. They hired a former Hudson's Bay Company carpenter, William Gladstone, to build the new fort with a crew of about 40, mostly Métis men. Fort Whoopup, as it became known, was built with squared cottonwood logs and was designed for defense. It was enclosed by a palisade with a heavy oak gate, bastions, high windows, and bars over the chimneys. It was also equipped with a rifle cannon on wheels and a smooth bore cannon. Buildings faced inward to an open central square. There was a kitchen, trading room, blacksmith shop, living quarters, stabling for the horses, a well, and cellars. Buffalo robes were the main trade commodity. Robes were sold in eastern markets as sleigh blankets or coats, while the hides made excellent belts for industrial machines. The robes were shipped east by steamboat on the upper Missouri River. At the peak of the robe trade, up to 75,000 robes passed through Fort Benton, Montana, each year. Most of the trade was done in winter months, when the buffalo robes were thickest. A whole head-and-tail robe was worth about $12 in trade goods, and a split robe, half that. First Nations' demand for certain types and quality of goods sharpened competition among traders. Buffalo robes, deer skins, wolf pelts, and other furs were exchanged for firearms, utensils, blankets, tobacco, flour, and other provisions. The most profitable trade good was whiskey, which was kept in a large barrel and dispensed by the jug or cupful. One to two liters of whiskey traded for one robe. This 
Fire water, as it was often called, was diluted with water, and might contain anything from chewing tobacco to burnt sugar, tea or ink to add flavor and color. News of Healy and Hamilton's rich profits drew other traders from Montana. A trail from Fort Benton to Fort Whoopup became a major route for bull trains carrying freight north and buffalo robes south. Soon, there were more than 50 trading posts in what is now southern Alberta, with names like Slide Out, Standoff, Kip, and Robber's Roost. Fort Whoopup was the largest and most notorious of them all. The traders were often described as crude opportunists, desperados, and hard cases, but several went on to become respected businessmen and politicians. While few of the traders became rich, merchants, such as T.C. Power and I.G. Baker, built large fortunes supplying the robe trade. For the Blackfoot people, trade brought many changes. We tried to make peace with the newcomers, and we welcomed the American and other traders. Trade for rifles, cloth, beads, metal goods, and whiskey built relationships, and changed lives. Little did we appreciate the tragic decade that would follow. Reports of devastation made their way to Ottawa. In 1873, Prime Minister Macdonald announced the formation of the Northwest Mounted Police to bring Canadian authority to the West and to close down the whiskey trade. On hearing of the Mounted Police's approach, some traders fled to Montana or reinvented themselves as legitimate traders. Hamilton left Fort Whoopup in 1873, though Healy stayed on for three more years. Near the end of their trek west, the Northwest Mounted Police hired a respected guide named Jerry Potts, who led them to Fort Whoopup on October 9, 1874. But instead of a rowdy whiskey trade, they found the fort nearly abandoned, with no whiskey in sight. The troops established their headquarters at Fort McLeod. From there, they patrolled the region and set up additional forts and outposts. The Northwest Mounted Police became respected by First Nations and feared by traders. By the end of 1875, they had brought the whiskey trade under control. In July 1876, John Healy sold Fort Whoopup to the resident manager, Dave Akers. Over the next five years, the great buffalo herds were decimated all across the plains as a result of commercial hunting. By 1881, the robe trade was finished. Akers turned to market gardening and rented space in the fort to the Northwest Mounted Police. During Acres' time there, Fort Whoopup was also a stopping point for stagecoach and mail service from Fort Benton. In 1893, Acres was killed by a former business partner over a long-standing argument. His death marked the end of an era. The whiskey trade had brought tremendous change to Nitsitapi, social and cultural life, but it was only the beginning. Already struggling with epidemics like smallpox and tuberculosis, the Blackfoot people were devastated by the loss of the buffalo. The Tsutina, Stony Nakoda, and the Sixigate Tsutapi nations signed Treaty 7 in 1877. Soon they were settled on reserves and receiving government rations. Yet despite the ongoing challenges, the Blackfoot people in southern Alberta were resilient and are vibrant nations with a strong traditional culture. The landscape was also transformed in the 1890s. Railways replaced bull trains, stagecoaches, and river steamboats. The trains carried settlers who, in turn, established farming, irrigation, and permanent towns. Since that time, the original site of Fort Whoopup has slowly been eroded by the changing flow of the Old Man River. In 1967, a reconstruction of the fort was created in Indian Battle Park. The replica was redeveloped in the 1980s, Today, the Fort Whoopup facility continues to tell the complex story of the brief but formative period of the buffalo robe and whiskey trade in southern Alberta. We invite visitors here at Fort Whoopup to learn some of our history and language and culture. We greet you all 